I also wanted to thank the New Academia Publishing Group, uh, Anna Lawton and uh, her, her assistants, uh, the Poet Laureate of, of Maryland, who's been a real supporter, and I, I'm just really grateful for her help. Alice Stevens, too, for being around all these years, and Seth, uh, as well, for really helping me to bring this, uh, this story to, to the public. I, I, I feel very strongly that nobody wants to read epic poetry, but um, when they see the images, uh, then they can approach the, the writing uh, with just more interest and more pleasure. So I really appreciate Seth being involved. And all of you for being here now, I thank you very much. So um, I just wanna start off by talking about the entirety of the project. It's a lot of information in the next 10 minutes, but um, it's really foundational. And so I just wanna to, to run with that. So the first thing is that I began this project as a response to a class that I was taking as a graduate student, which was the study of the Divine Comedy, uh, which is a very big fat uh, epic poem written by Dante Alighieri in the 13, early 1300s. And uh, my professor, whose name is Tony Wolk uh, at PSU, also one of my mentors and guides, um, said that I could write an, uh, an analytical paper if I wanted to, but he also said, if you have some sort of creative response, uh, go for it. So I decided that uh, rather than you know, examine things scholastically, I would just create my own uh, formulation of Dante's uh, story uh, placed over an American, uh, or American history, essentially. So um, I used Dante's architecture, going into hell, coming out of hell into uh, purgatory, going through purgatory and up to um, paradise, uh, and just kind of broke it up a little differently than Dante. Uh, for us, perdition is 1976 backwards to 1900. Uh, limbo is 1899 to 1826, and then 1826 to 1776 is the Elysium, the, the, the uh, heaven. But you know, in terms of Dante, to me, the things were, his humanistic attitude, meaning anybody can improve themselves, anybody can uh, achieve their own salvation. The episodic scenes with uh, you know, identifiable power people, um, uh, the purpose of helping people to attain their enlightenment, all of these things were uh, what I was taking from Dante, uh, but there are things that I twisted as well. So where Dante was writing this poem, uh, as a morality, a tale of morality, meaning you should behave this way so that you can attain your enlightenment. Um, I, I called that morality with love. My angle as, uh, as D. Selby Fing was irony with love. And that was um, things don't work out the way they should. And um, we're living in an ironic age and we could go on and on about irony. I definitely do not take a cynical view of irony. I just simply say it's, it's, the opposite of morality. It's not the way things should be, it's the way that they actually are. But the love is an important part of it. And that comes from another author who influenced me, Lawrence Stern. He's uh, an author from uh, the 18th century in England. He had been a, a preacher for most of his life and he gave it up and wrote a couple of amazing uh, books that, that uh, I read as a, as a graduate student and really informed the writing of Actually, not just the writing, but the creation of the character D. Selby Fing. So Stern created a couple of different characters, Tristram Shandy and uh, Yorick, who is a parson. And um, he bounced in between those uh, himself. And I thought that that, that creation was really good. Uh, and so I ultimately just said to myself, uh, I want to have some distance between myself, the writer, and the material that I'm writing. So I created this character, D. Selby Fing and put him into uh, this, this kind of architecture that Dante had created. And rather than have Virgil carry uh, me around, I had Abraham Lincoln as, as the Virgil. And uh, rather than follow Beatrice, I uh, created a character whose name is Lilica del Rio. And so, um, so in that sense, put De Selby thing in motion, and uh, you know, at that point, I was 35 years old, and I just didn't want to write about myself anymore. So uh, Rimbaud uh, said, "I is someone else," and that's pretty much uh, the way that that I created D. Selby Fing. So uh, just so that you know, it's not me. And I knew uh, pretty much when I started writing the poem 
that uh, I was going to be killing D. Selby Fing off. He's, he's way too erratic, way too emotional for me. And um, it would add to the drama and the, and the, the plotting of, of things. So um, that's kind of how that, the, the creation of that character went. So again, um, I know that people don't really like to read epic poetry. Uh, and um, so I also knew pretty much early on that I was gonna need to create multiple levels for people to approach this thing. So the first thing that I did was I, I started to write notes you know, when you read a big, long, epic poem, there's half of the book is the notes just explaining what's going on. So um, I, I decided that I was gonna have to do that, but rather than just make them plain, up, plain straight up notes, I decided to, um, to fictionalize them. So I, I, I had D. Selby Fink kill himself and leave behind two sons. And so the elder son uh, picks up the, the poem when he when he's about 15 years old, about eight years after his father dies, and starts to read it and try to understand it to just to kind of retrieve, you know, his father and know who his father was. Uh, and so as he grows up and becomes uh, an adult, he becomes an English major and he starts to write the notes to the poem. So uh, the, po the poem itself took me about a year to write. The notes took me about four years to write because I was teaching and living and doing other things. Uh, and, um, and then I actually wrote another uh, book of short stories once that was over. So between uh, these five books, it took me about eight years uh, to write all of it. And so that's from 2000 to 2008. And, uh, and really since then, I've just been trying to find a way to, to get this thing published. And there's no question in my mind that um, having uh, reconnected with Seth, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, our, our story, uh, that was really the thing that 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 set all of this in motion. Uh, and as I said, I have a vision for photography, photography for the second book, and uh, collage pieces for the third book. And I'm just hoping that uh, you know we get to keep moving forward, uh, publishing all these things that have been in the in the in the in the box for about 12 years. Um, so. Uh, the, the annotations have two purposes. One is to explain the poem itself, and the other is to flesh out the life of D. Selby Fing, uh, which, uh, as Karen said, is kind of an, an itinerant teacher in the 60s and 70s. Um, he uh, had been born uh, in 1941. His father was a soldier and killed in World War II, and so he was left with his grandparents in Philadelphia. Um, they uh, they raised him to be a priest, and uh, that didn't go very well. Uh, I'll leave I'll leave uh, the rest of that biography uh, so that you can read the the, the stories uh, eventually when they come out. Um, but uh, let's see get to my notes. the The real thing was that I was motivated. I mean, along the lines of this multimedia thing, I was really motivated by seven hundred years of art that have have followed. Uh, Dante's writing of the Divine Comedy. So if you go, you know, just type in images for the Divine Comedy in Google, and you'll see hundreds of years of different interpretations. And when I saw that, I thought, okay, uh, then there's a way. There's a way to get the words out there. And um, so that's what I wanted for the Profane Comedy. I wanted people to read it, and I wanted them to engage in it. And so um, I think that this is a good time for me to kind of uh, bring Seth in. He can kind of tell uh, the story from his angle, um, and uh, and then you know we'll we'll talk a little bit more about the writing and, and the book itself. But uh, Seth and I are just going to kind of bounce around now. Seth, up to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's what I think is interesting about this is that is is how we met, of course, uh, when uh, in the small town of Silver City, New Mexico, which is very close to the Mexican border. It's about a hundred miles north. Uh, my sophomore year of high school. Uh, I came to find out that Will was going to be my sophomore English teacher. And uh, we, yeah, we, we, uh, we connected and, uh, you know, for as much of a, a, a punk 15 year old and his English teacher can be friends, we were, we were friends. And uh, it was a relationship that really kind of stuck with me and though we didn't really uh, stay in touch much after that i it was a relationship that stuck with me and a number of years later a mutual uh a fellow student from high school 
who was also friends with Will, had uh, made contact with him and gave me his information. And that was, that was probably eight years ago that we reconnected. Maybe so. Seemed, doesn't seem like that long, but. Yeah, maybe a little less. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> the rest, I guess, is, is where we are now. Um, so I, just to add a little to that story, I was 27, and um, uh, my wife and I had left New York City after um, uh, you know, years uh, of living in the big city uh, and really just trying to uh, live a little bit more cheaply, a little bit more uh, quietly, and do a lot of writing. So I had been in Silver City for about a year and a half, and uh, Alice got pregnant, and oh goodness, well, you know, you can't, you can't uh, raise a child when you're not making any money. So uh, I applied to work uh, as a high school teacher, and um, I was given a, soft, a sophomore, I don't I can't even remember, remember now, sophomore English class, and I think, Seth, you were in the, the uh, yearbook class too, is that not correct? Uh, journalism? Is that what they called it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember who the, it was. It's a little hazy for me. As as yeah. As things yeah, are in high school. Actually, we, we could get into a, a few stories if you want to, but maybe maybe after drinks. We can do this at yeah. the after party. <laughs> so you know, I left. Uh, I left Silver, Silver City. Kind of. I, I mean, I was happy to 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 go back to. We we moved to Portland, Oregon, and I was happy to get back into a big city or a relatively big city. I love I loved the, the Southwest, but just needed a little bit more stimulation. Um, and then about five years later, we went to Japan and it just, you know, Seth was, was doing his own thing. And so it was really kind of fortuitous that uh, our mutual friend brought us back together. And when I realized the, the prolific nature of his artwork, I just felt like this is the guy who's gonna help me to break through. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the book. I mean, Seth is probably going to share some things. This is just one of the drawings that he's done. And I asked him, you know, the, the, there's a lot of spiral imagery. Can, can you do something, something kind of raw and something kind of bloody? And, uh, and, and that's kind of how it went. So um, I, as I recall, we, we visited you for this, the official kind of uh, meeting uh, in Seattle with, when we were traveling with my son. Is that right? You were Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, you came into our uh, gallery. My wife and I own a, a, an art gallery in, in Seattle. Um, and you stopped by and we, that was, I think, our first face-to-face -face since high school. Um, yeah, a lot more tattoos. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, the, that's the nature of the business. <laughs> hey, do you ever tattoo yourself? Oh, yeah, to practice. I've tattooed myself quite a lot. Okay. Oh, that's very interesting. I have ongoing projects on myself. So. That right. Well, I, I, you know, if anybody wants to get a tattoo, you got to go to Seattle. Uh, <laughs> Seth is amazing. Okay. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's basically it. I, I, you know, Seth could probably show you a couple of other pictures. He said he had some, um, some free, free ones there just so that you can take a look. I don't know how many of you have actually seen the book. Um, it, it's really, it's, I just think that the, the illustrations make it, uh, immediately approachable. I mean, it's weird, but um, I'm just really grateful for what Seth has done. I just figured what we would do is we would kind of talk a little bit about um, the story itself and uh, essentially the history. And so that Seth and I could just kind of remark on these, uh, these scenes um, that, that, you know, that thing is walking into. What, 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 are, what are the symbols? What are they representing? Um, so, you know, um, Seth, can you just, uh, explain a little bit about your uh, experience as a, as a history student or as a you know, stu studying history? So I, I've always been interested in history, nominally interested in history since I was a, a kid. And that, that really kind of started with the American Civil War. We had family out on the East Coast. And so we would drive from New Mexico out to Virginia. And for whatever reason, I was really interested in that. And so we would, I would make my parents stop at Civil War battlefields. Um, and uh, that sort of my interest in history waned a bit, but by the time I was in my early 20s, uh, starting sort of in fits and starts to go to college, uh, I stumbled across a memoir from a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. And that led to pretty much 10 years of studying uh, first uh, American involvement in Vietnam, um, American political 
the American political landscape and then it and then kind of broadened into uh, American imperialism and um, uh, American imperialism in Latin America, specifically around Mexico. Um, and I ended up going to the University of Washington here in Seattle and got my degree in history there. Um, so history has always kind of been an undercurrent, um, but uh, that was, it was also kind of a way when I was still finding myself in my early 20s and figuring out what I was going to do with my life. Um, uh, the history was a way for me to practice my art. So I would just draw from historical photographs. Um, and so that kind of, that sort of practice um, aspect of the history still remains a part of my routine. Um, and so I think that, I think you probably saw that in my art um, when, and that's probably what made it click is that I have focused so much on historically representing things. Um, through my art. You do some amazing pamphlets of like unknown histories of uh, uh, organizing unions, you know, in different communities. And uh, the, the, those things are so dramatic and obviously the stories are just, uh, you know, incredible. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I don't know how well you can see this, but a couple of years ago, I did uh, a series of comics about uh, religious cults in the Pacific Northwest. Um, including some that now have Netflix specials, but at the time, nobody really knew about them yet, or nobody that hadn't been around when they existed. Um, I've, I've done, I worked with another writer to do a, a sort of history of Elvis's last days. Um, but uh, yeah, I, in, there's a couple of local papers here in Seattle that uh, have published uh, comic strips that I've done about local historical events. Um, yeah, labor organizing, uh, uh, you know, infrastructural disasters, we'll say, <laughs> um, stuff Probably. like that. Yeah. There's a really famous bank robber in Seattle called Hollywood, operated in the early 90s, the mo most prolific bank robber in American history. Most people don't know about him. So okay. I do that kind of stuff pretty regularly when I'm not tattooing. Yeah, and that really was the, the thing that appealed to me. Um, you know, in an epic poem, uh, the, the, the person who chooses to write an epic poem is, is going to sift through the entirety of uh, his, his or her society uh, and to try to find, and generally what you find is literature, history, and philosophy are the three kind of key things that um, really drive the story. And so, um, you know, realizing that the historical, uh, was going to be a, like one of the legs of the of the the triangle or the stool that this thing was going to work on that um having somebody who really understood the history that i was examining from a deeper level and more particularly from a from the 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 lower like the uh, the howard zinn uh, a people's history not you know not the power not not the the power people's history but you know those at the furthest reach of power but, you know the just the, the how an individual tries to deal with their own history. Um, so uh, just, just as an example, um, you showed Elvis. So there's a scene um, in, in the poem when um, Fing and Lincoln walk into uh, a room where Marilyn Monroe and James Dean and Elvis Presley are kind of keeping the desk and uh, they have to somehow check in with them before they continue with their journey. And so, um, you know, these people are mythical. And so uh, they, they're way beyond just, um, a, a, you know, an individual, right? It's not just, you know, Fing meeting somebody on the street. And so um, there had to be some kind of drama. There had to be some kind of image that would uh, make them, you know, bigger than life. And I don't know if Seth, if you have that particular image, I have it here, yeah. So we, we did a couple of uh, iterations and so, the, the line is before they became what they couldn't sustain. And I just, I always like that line a lot um, because how do you know if you're becoming what you can't sustain? And essentially what they became was, you know, statues. And, uh, you know, it's tough to live your life as a statue. Uh, so, you know, essentially it was, it's this kind of commentary, I guess, you know, that's a little less history and more celebrity, but um, you know, it, it's, 
essentially the way that, that I'm approaching it. Um, I didn't talk so much about wars, but uh, unquestionably the Vietnam War is like central to, um, to everything that's come after it. And so uh, it's no surprise to me, Seth, that you know, the Vietnam War introduced you to history. It certainly did that to me. Um, I guess I went a little further back. I think um, I was thinking a lot when I was younger about uh, the Soviet Union. Like, why is the Soviet Union our enemy? Didn't we fight with them at one point? And so that, what, what was that shift about? And that's kind of what got me into um, studying World War II and World War I and then the, Re the Russian Revolution and then, you know, how a person like Stalin or Hitler can can take power and, and you know, kind of just destroy a society. So um, these are the historical things that kind of going through my mind. Seth, is there anything you want to add to that? Or No, I think uh, the, the sort of false dichotomy of the Cold War, I think is definitely that, how that played out in Vietnam definitely led me into much of the stuff that was much further back that you're talking about, the Russian Revolution and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I definitely, I definitely hear where you're coming from. Well, you know, ra history is a rabbit hole. As soon as you start, you know, going down it, you just keep going because there, there it never stops. Mark, I know you know that too. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's fascinating. And so it, it informs so much of the poem. Uh, just while we're, we're on the subject of philosophy also, um, I would say that, uh, you know, the key philosopher uh, in, in, in this uh, poem is Michel Foucault. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, more well known than well read, um, but the way that I think of Foucault is uh, examinations of power. And um, if if this poem is 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 anything, it's an examination how an individual can uh, achieve power for themselves. Um, you know, we we're definitely led to believe that we don't have much uh, power as individuals, uh, but Foucault really worked hard to make sure that uh, if you understood him and you could you know, ba band together with other people, you could make a big difference. And um, so that to me is, is a real important philosophical thing. Uh, I guess I, I could talk a little bit about uh, some other writers, uh, but actually Seth, can you, can you talk a little bit about um, the process of doing the drawings? Just kind of kick it out around. Yeah, so basically what, what I, asked Will to do when he first approached me about this uh, is, is I said, um, what I would like you to do is basically pick out the lines that are most important to you that you think most need representation visually. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll pare that down to something that's manageable for both of us. Um, I think at the time we had a, we, we were talking about a timeline of something like a year, but then in, in the midst of that, <laughs> In the midst of that, I got married and I started tattooing and things kind of unraveled a little bit, but we got it done. Um, thank you for your patience, Will. <laughs> um, so uh, we narrowed it down to, I believe, 30, 30 lines. Um, and for each set, I think I did it in roughly sets of five, something like that, four or five. And so I would do thumbnails. Uh, oftentimes what I would do, since they had a uh, they had well-known historical figures like uh, Richard Nixon in the image and Abraham Lincoln, of course, quite frequently. Um, what I would do is I would do a, a bunch of practice sketches of the figures that that character's face in my sketchbook. So I have a, I have a couple pages in my sketchbook that are completely filled with Richard Nixon's face, unfortunately. Um, yeah, horrible. But, <laughs> but uh, he, well, he does have his face was very, it was had a lot of character to it. Um, but uh, so I would do I would do a bunch of sketches like that. And then I would do some thumbnails uh, that I would then send off to Will to see, you know, kind of how he felt about him if, if that was really, uh, you know, capturing what he had envisioned with that scene. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, they would not and I would come up with some more. Uh, but for the most part, I think we, we, we mostly saw eye to eye. Um, and uh, after the thumbnails were approved, then I would go on to do the finals. I used uh, pen and ink with uh, red watercolor because Will said he wanted it to be kind of three colors, um, just black, white, and red. So uh, black ink and red watercolor is all I used. And the white space. Yeah. Yep. 
negative space. That's always important. Yeah, and I think you know it, it definitely shows in the in in, in the drawings. It's really, yeah. really fabulous. I, I you know I always felt badly when I said to Seth, "Well, that's not exactly what I wanted," because I know he was working really hard, and 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 he he and I definitely have you know we we had a wavelength, and so I you know that's that was something that I didn't want to disturb. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to do my reading now and, um, and then, you know, we kind of open things up uh, subsequently. Unless, Seth, there's anything more that you want to add? Show, show some pictures, maybe? Just on the, on the subject of, of rejected drawings, the one that I showed you earlier with the statues, uh, this one, that was the one we arrived at. The original one, speaking of the Cold War, right. was, was this sort of toppled statue of Lenin with graffiti on it. And Will told me, uh, he said, I like it, but I, I specifically want James Dean and Marilyn Monroe to be the statues. Um, there were a few, there were a few pieces that uh, I did several times because I just didn't like the layout. This is uh, Lincoln greeting uh, Franklin Roosevelt. I think this was an early version on the, right on the back. I just flipped it over and started again. And I liked, I liked both of those. But it, yeah. in, in particular, the one where uh, where FDR's got the the the, the cigarette the holder, cigarette holder sticking out yeah. of his mouth. I just yeah. And then he's got a great grin. You, I mean, you gotta if you see those actual photographs of him, he's got a great grin when he's got that cigarette holder in his mouth. Yeah. Also, that's the only scene where Lincoln actually shakes the hand of somebody who says, oh, you're Abraham Lincoln, I'm so happy to meet you. All the others, he says, no, I'm not talking to you. No, I'm not talking to you, but he, he actually shakes uh, FDR's hand and Fing is amazed by that. Before you do your reading, can I show you a couple more of my, my personal favorites from the series? Yes, um, I really like this one. Eisenhower with nuclear arms. Yes, his, his arms are made out of ICBMs. So once you if once you actually get a copy of the book, it, that might be a little more clear. But it's really it's a really fun image. Actually, we have a couple right from that scene with Eisenhower. Yes, yeah. There's one with the figures of authority, kind of as these sort of hazy figures behind him. Yeah. yeah. Um, this one is, I believe, uh, Harry Truman vomiting cockroaches. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, he he has it tough. He's almost at the very bottom of hell, and so he's been incinerated by a, a nuclear explosion. Uh, and then after it's over, he throws up cockroaches. And then, of course, back to Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon being flayed by the devil. I think Seth's Satan is unbelievable. I kind of had it in my mind. The uh, oh, I'm blanking on the the the, the Kenneth Anger. I had Anger, Kenneth, yeah. I kind of had Kenneth Anger's devil uh, in my head, but Seth totally blew that out of the water. I was very well. Happy. I. For, I took inspiration from from uh, medieval artwork. The if you see the devil in medieval artwork, he always has. It, it may be hard to tell here, but you can see right there. There's another face where his groin is. Yeah. In, in medieval artwork, the the devil or demons often have faces in their in their groin and sometimes in the corners, like in their elbows and knees. But I did try to capture a little bit of the Kenneth Anger in the face. Yeah, I, well, I you know I, I, it worked pretty well for me, so uh, I, I certainly am not Good. complaining. That's a that's a wonderful, uh, <laughs> a wonderful Satan. Thank you, Seth. Okay, so I am gonna uh, I'm gonna take uh, the next 10, 15 minutes, or uh, maybe a little less, to uh, to focus on one of the scenes uh, from the 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 book. And just kind of show it to you in a few different ways. And maybe Seth, if you have that uh, the drawing of the brothers killing the brothers, we can show that. It doesn't have to be right now, but um, the idea being that uh, I'm going to present you three different ways uh, that this scene ha is kind of communicated to the reader, and then Seth has the fourth way, which is the drawing. So in this case, um, Lincoln and Fing have been together for a little while. Lincoln has asked Fing not to talk to the people in the scenes that they're going through, uh, but in the last scene with Herbert Hoover, uh, Fing couldn't stop himself, and he said, "You know, other people are coming behind me," and Fing kind of or uh, Lincoln pushes him out of the room, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna share uh, about 25 lines from the poem, and then another uh, uh, 
then a little bit from the annotations, an explanation from the annotations, and then I'm gonna play, play it on guitar for you. Okay, here we go. My leader cast glances at me which were withering. I remembered then what he had told me before. I should be listening and not blithering. And a vision blistered through my consciousness, the dream as I perambulated of this man being born a Kentuckian and then to Missouri having emigrated where masters and slaves were the lay of the land. I did see a nation devastated and he had not spoken. Divided union I scanned, where brothers kill brothers with limbs amputated, war ceaseless between them, each of them damned to cursing revenge on the other, whose mother and sister were raped by the brother who will always avenge himself for the sins wrought upon him. Complete, I saw millions of maimed and raped and killed who might otherwise be of service as lovers with soft hands, whose beards are anxiety ridden, whose kisses might be shared as generously as the ballistics which rip the forests to shreds. The man beside me was a savior as venerably as the souls macheted, dying septic deaths in the fields and the cities of the land of liberty, but unique in manner and words and sense. My silence was now the only prerequisite. So again, just to take a moment, uh, Lincoln is kind of tiring of Fing uh, not keeping his mouth shut during these scenes. He's supposed to just be uh, observing and not so much participating. So that's, the, that's the, the poem itself. And so when it comes to the annotations, what I did was I said, D. Selby Fing Jr., who is the, one, the elder son who was left behind when his father died, um, read the poem and tried to understand what all, all these scenes mean. And this is what his interpretation of those uh, 23, 25 lines are. The conceit begins as a vision where Fing imagines that Lincoln's father, whose family was from Kentucky, had not moved on away from slavery into, in, into Indiana, where Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809, 10 years before Indiana became a state, and Kentucky had become a state in 1792. Rather, Fing imagines Lincoln's father accepting slavery just as readily as his relatives did, and moving on, not north, but west, to Missouri, which also was a slave state, admitted to the United States two years after Indiana, and one year after the infamous Missouri Compromise, which Fing knew was a watershed moment in the institutionalization of racism in the North, based on moral superiority without moral strength, and for the eventual catastrophe of the Civil War, which brought about the death of Lincoln. So he's imagining what might have been the fate of the nation and Lincoln himself if Lincoln had been a slaver. And he says, I did see a nation devastated. Line 259 implies that all which Fing has understood and all which he is to understand has been understood without the use of spoken words. And Fing's vision is immense. He seems to see the entire countryside in conflagration, unending battles between brothers, revenge, and rape, with syntax that blurs action and agency into a mass of amputation and vengeance. Fing then flips that reality on its head and imagines that these dead and maimed people might otherwise have been lovers, gentle, civilized, with trimmed beards and clipped anxieties, and who might have been just as willing to kiss you as to hurl mechanized steel at your body. The conclusion being that Lincoln was a savior as venerably as the soul's machete, dying septic deaths in the fields and the cities of the land of liberty. To Fing, it was important that all men were created equal, all can be saviors, all are saviors. And if that ain't love, so that's D. Selby Fing Jr.'s interpretation. And uh, as I said, I uh, have, to take, have to start breathing deeply here, people. I have turned this into a song cycle. Uh, one of the benefits of being uh, in the basement all summer long during a pandemic is that uh, you got to find something to do. And so what I did was I created, um, I, I turned the, the, the poem into lyrics uh, and with the help of some, uh, some good friends, uh, I, I created 22 songs. 
And I'm going to play all 22 of them right now. Oops. Go figure that the guitar strap is going to slip off. All right, so again, this song is based on that scene where Lincoln is angry at Fing for talking out of turn and trying to get him to understand that uh, there, there's more to be understood than just uh, you know saying what you want to say. How's that? Is that too much harmonica? Too loud? Oh, thank you, everybody. All right. It's a quiet song. A glance that was with rain. I remembered what he said. I should be listening and not blithering. Then I was in a dream where Lincoln was born in Kentucky and moved to the slave state of misery. I saw the nation devastate, division across the land, where brothers killed brothers, with limbs amputated, war ceases between them, each one of them damned to cursing revenge on the other whose mother and sister were raped by the brother who will always avenge himself. Sins wrought upon him. Complete, I saw millions maimed and killed. This man was a savior as venerably. As souls bayoneted, dying septic dead in the fields and the cities of the land of liberty. But unique in manner and words and sense. So I must be silent. be silent. No. Have to be silent. gives us a little bit of time. A little bit of time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for watching. Um, uh, Karen, were you, you're working the chat. Uh, should we just go with questions from there, if there are any, or what, what's, the, what's the best bet? So far, there's just compliments. Um, oh, okay. so, so, um, but I'm sure people now that are they're prompted will start having questions. So, whatever whatever works, um, you know. I guess uh, one thing that uh, I wanted to do was to talk about what's coming next. That we 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 still have a pretty good amount of time. So, um, hold on again, just a second. Do you want to see the Do you want to see the image for that please, scene? Yeah, please. Right. So I'll, also, this was one that we kind of worked on a little bit more. 
Um, I asked uh, Seth to give it a little bit more Civil War, uh, oh, that's lovely, a little more Civil War kind of imagery. So we put the guns in, um, but the house burning down seemed to me pretty good. Yeah, the caps too, right? Sorry, just my gallery view. Yeah, okay, so um, in terms of what's next, uh, there are two more books uh, to the poem. One is Limbo, and it's, uh, it's set in uh, New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's where my, my parents were both born, or well, grew up, and uh, it's, I spent a lot of time there. So to me, it's a really quintessential American place. And uh, of the three books, it's the only one that, um, that is actually in reality. Uh, you know, uh, it, Perdition is, is this, this red cartoon and um, the, the uh, Elysium is taking place in, up in the sky. So um, I decided that um, we needed something real for illustration and that's where my friend James Prochnik came in. He's, uh, He's a master photographer, and so we have done some scouting up in New Bedford and some preliminary photograph taking, and uh, well, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated. Uh, with Seth, I could say, hey, Seth, can you do this? And he'd say, well, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And then he did it, and I'd say, well, no, can we do it a different way? That'd be fine. But if you're gonna be taking pictures of people, uh, or actors in particular, uh, it's gotta be much better organized, and it costs more money than, than, uh, than, than I have at the moment disposable. So that's a big, a big part uh, of the next step. And then beyond that, well, why don't I show you? <clears throat> uh, with the understanding that the individual artist, um, you know, uh, rather than the person who is making a big production, uh, can get things done more quickly, I decided that I would do the third section, Elysium, by myself, and to create collages, and these are 11 by 14, they're quite big, create collages, like Seth uh, asked uh, me to, you know, kind of give him singular lines. I did the same thing here. And, you know, it, it, it's hard to see uh, exactly what's going on in this, but I've done 120 collages and hopefully 30 of them will be good enough to, to go into the book. Um, a couple of them are, are actually double size. So it's pretty crazy. And so, you know, someday I'm hoping that, uh, that all three of these will be illustrated and out there. Um, and, you know, well, <laughs> and then, you know, fame will take care of itself. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much what's coming next. Um, again, there's, there's the annotations and the short story that comes after that. Um, but I'm, I'm, it's hard for me to see that far into the future. There is one question, which is from Alice Stevens, to ask, why did you go backward in time with the founding of the country occurring as Elysium? Yeah, well, um, is there a simple answer? I guess, you know, I just felt like the 20th century was much more complicated um, and really much more hellish. Um, uh, certainly not the same kind of triumph if you're, if you're, if you're thinking of yourself as, uh, as an American who, you know, uh, really has pride in the history of the United States. 1776 is, is a very positive time. And so it seemed to me like um, uh, having, you know, Elysium Paradise at that, at that period was a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit easier to believe than in the 20th century. So, um, you know, um, really, the part of the irony of of this, the way that this poem is put together, is that um, um, everybody who lived from 1900 to 1976 is in perdition. It's not, it, it's not whether you were a good person or a bad person. They all got dumped there. So again, that's the kind of a, a, an opposite of morality, right? It should have been that everybody was judged separately, but because, uh, because it's an ironic world, everybody gets thrown into perdition. So that's, that's the way it goes backwards. Everybody from 1826 to 1899 is, is in limbo, and uh, 1776 to 1826 is, uh, is, in, is in Elysium. The next question is, what's the etymology of thing? Yeah, um, so, uh, the, the story of Fing, the, just that word, 
uh, I told you I got tired of writing about myself and I'll tell you precisely why. Um, I was, um, I, I have always kind of kept a journal and for, for uh, you know, for many years, it was just about me. And then we had kids. And uh, I started writing things like, uh, my first son went through five diapers in two hours. And uh, like, you, you can't imagine how quickly that kind of information fills up a journal. And so I felt like, uh, I, don't, I don't really want to talk about my kids' bowel movements and diapers and the smell of diapers. So um, I closed my journal, but before I closed it, I put the word fing, almost like, you know, like fing, like, like the end, but there was a G on it. And, uh, and then I closed it and I didn't get back to it for a few years. Uh, so it was a nonsense word. It just meant like, you know, uh, but when I, when I started to study uh, Lawrence Stern and I realized that he had uh, created these alter egos, um, I thought, well, I need, to, I need to come up with a name. And uh, the, the, D. Selby fart, the D. Selby part comes from um, uh, a book by uh, Flan O'Brien called The Third Policeman, also a very bizarre story, kind of like Alice in Wonderland in, in uh, Ireland. And um, he had this character, DeSelby, who was just a, a maniac, uh, a scientist who's just trying to make sense of the nonsense of the world. So I took DeSelby and made him DeSelby and opened up my journal and there was the, the last name, Fink, just sitting there and that's it. So that's how I chose that name, but then, uh, as I had to flesh out his actual uh, biography, I made it that uh, his name was actually Fingrelian, that he was uh, Armenian and that his, uh, his grandparents had fled uh, Eastern Anatolia in 1915 and settled in Philadelphia. And uh, of course went through Ellis Island and had their name shortened from Fingrelian to uh, Fing. Uh, I have looked up uh, Armenian family names, and I've never seen Fingrelian uh, among them. So I, I, I'm sorry to any Armenians who are upset about that. So here's another question, which is in a different direction altogether, which is, do you see the work as a series of graphic novel-like works with the idea of appealing to a younger or different audience? I definitely think it's a younger audience, and it's, it's nothing against uh, all of us old people, but um, epic poetry is not written for the present. It's really written for the future, and so um, it is for younger people. I remember uh, communicating with Seth, and I'm sure he must have rolled his eyes when I said it. Early on, uh, I told him, I'm going to show this to an agent, and uh, I think the agents are going to love it, and we're you know, going to really go. And... Um, and uh, I said, if the agent really likes it, we may have to do panels, right? We may have to not just do 30 drawings, but like a whole book. And I don't recall, Seth, you're saying anything in response to that. You, do you recall that? I don't even remember that, but yeah. I, I, I may have rolled my eyes. You'd be, you'd be surprised how often people approach artists and are like, hey, I've got a great idea. You draw it for me and then we'll see if we can sell it. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I definitely, and actually, I see people roll their eyes at my visions all the time. Uh, my kids, my wife, it's just, you know, I mean, I, my brain is too active. I get it. Um, so uh, that, um, I guess that's, that's the answer to that question. Is it? Could I answer it? Anything else? I see lots of chatting. Oh, here's one. In your wildest imagination, could you have seen this book coming out in the midst of a pandemic and everything else going on around us? So, you know, history definitely plays a part in this. Um, when, uh, when I finished the, the poem, it was spring of 2001. And um, I asked a friend of mine to uh, create a website uh, where we could put uh, not the whole poem, but a portion of the poem, and then a portion of the notes, too. And um, we worked on that for a few months. And um, on the, the eve, he was, he was in Virginia, and I was in Portland, Oregon. And on the evening that we went live, uh, it was one o'clock in the morning on September 11th, 2001 in Virginia. It was about 10 o'clock in the evening in Portland. So he told me, I'm putting this out there. And I thought, now we're going to go. Now it's, you know, the, the train is rolling. And uh, the next morning, um, it, it seemed to kind of just eradicate uh, even the meaning of the poem. 
So in 2001, uh, I felt that history had totally overtaken me and that there, you know, this, this poem was essentially almost meaningless. Um, not that I laid off it, but I just felt like, well, you know, I can't put this out now. So now it's 20 years later and it's coming out and I can't even leave my house. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I guess I, I'm kind of used to it. Uh, it's, um, it's ironic, isn't it? And so uh, my thing is that uh, I want to be ironic with love. So it's okay that it happened that way. I find it interesting that it's that it's uh, coming out at this particular moment. And uh, of course, you're we're all dealing with a pandemic. In my particular case, up here in the Pacific Northwest, everything is on fire, mm -hmm. and it's unhealthy to leave the house because of the level of smoke. And that immediately, this question made me immediately think of this illustration from the book. Yeah, in the fog. So. which we're on we're on day six here in seattle of gray yellow skies and pretty much unbreathable air so uh that happens in a moment of the poem where fing is almost able to see what the reasoning is for his going on the journey it's like i almost saw it i almost understood why i'm having to go through this and then the fog kind of covers his eyes and and he just he, he, got, he doesn't realize it so um, you know, life is, uh, is definitely um, going to interfere. Uh, I, I wish that, uh, I, wish that uh, I could be, you know, out and about and, you know, someday maybe. And I see that Solveig, you have uh, asked if we can get a CD. Um, I, I, what I intend on doing is posting um, the, the songs on Bandcamp. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that, um, that uh, kind of program. Uh, I have a band. I've already recorded an album. The, if you go to Bandcamp and look up the band, I'll type it in here. It's the Microcosmic Examples. My spelling, micro, Microcosmic Examples. So if you go to Bandcamp and look up the Microcosmic Examples, you'll see uh, that I, I, we put, a, we put a, a, an album out there, about 30 minutes of songs, about three or four years ago. And I hope to put the, the songs up there. Um, they're all originals, so um, that's a space for them. Uh, I just don't know when. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's on the to-do list. There's another question that came just to me, which is about the sort of layout of the book itself and how the annotations operate as part of the text. Uh, are they, is it laid out adjacent? Or, or do you have to page to the back? Like, are they printed? Like, or how is that all working? I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Are we talking about a printed book or are we talking about a website? The printed book. Well, the printed book has no notes. It's just the poem. Okay. So, um, what I, what I imagine is these three poet, you know, poetry books will be published alone. And then, you know, maybe okay. we'll, we'll jettison the illustrations and just put the poem all together and then add the annotations to the back. But um, if you go to dselbyfing.com, uh, which I'm entering into the chat there, you'll see that I have put about 480 lines of the poem on the left side and then the, the corresponding annotations on the right side. So you can scroll down, uh, you know, side by side and get uh, a pretty good sense of what, you know, the bigger vision is. Um, and that, that's that, that dselbyfing.com website is the one that uh, opened up on September 11th, 2001. All right, so we're in the last couple of minutes here, and I just want to again thank everybody. I, you know, this is uh, it's been a long time coming, and uh, you know, I really do appreciate your your supporting me and, and being here, and um, and thank you. I, I hope that we can all get together sometime to have a party. Maybe at Seth's, we can all get a, a tattoo of of your favorite scene from Perdition. <laughs> Linda, I know, I know you. <laughs> Thanks for bringing me along on the ride, Will. It's been fun. Well, you know, it's really, I, I owe you a lot. So we'll be talking more about that going forward. Yeah, at some point, we're hoping to do a, a art show of the original illustrations at the gallery in Ballard, so in, in Seattle. So, Well, if we can, if, if we're all moving around next spring, then I, that's when I can get my tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, Linda, you're coming with us. You bet. <laughs>
Take care. Thanks for coming, everybody. Right. Thanks so much, and congratulations to you both on the wonderful work. And thank you, everybody, for coming, and, and hooray. Hooray. Right. Okay. Karen, I really appreciate your, your efforts, too. Thank you very much, and I, I, I'm sure we're going to talk again soon. Yes, that'd be great. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you again.